Attention Kroger shoppers. Did you know there's a world of innovative services and patient care right in store? It's where an award-winning pharmacy and nationally recognized care come together. Connect with one of our licensed pharmacists today at your local Kroger and experience the care you and your family deserve. Kroger Health, a world of care is in store. Services and availability vary by location. Age and other restrictions may apply. For coverage, consult your health insurance company. Visit the pharmacy or our site for details. Warning, this episode contains the F word, by which I mean fuck. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by My Sheets Rock and by their lesser known sister company, My Sheets Roll. My Sheets Roll. Because it feels like Roll got fucked out of its own musical genre at some point, doesn't it? And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Scathing Atheist. This is Morgan. No, not that Morgan. From the YouTube channel Humanist Reacts. And as someone who keeps being told that I'm just not open-minded enough to get all the subtle intellectual social commentary in Tom McDonald's songs, I can assure you that we are in fact still evolving from filthy monkey creatures. It's August 17th. <laughs> and it's Baby Boomer Appreciation Day. Love you, Noah. I'm, I, I'm on the young side of Gen X, damn it. I have no illusions. <laughs> I'm Elder Millennial Eli Posnick. And from the state that gave us bubble wrap and the state that gave us Rico charges, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, Christianity Today finally separates itself from that Christ fella. We'll chat with Artificial Jesus. And Lucinda will be here to help us finish off David Icke. I don't like it when you say it that way. But first, <laughs> the diatribe. One hundred and six dead and counting. Over twenty two hundred structures destroyed. At least two hundred and twenty two families displaced. Over five billion dollars in damage. But don't worry. A church is fine, so God's doing his part. I'm talking, of course, about the wildfires that swept through Hawaii last weekend are to a much lesser extent still smoldering as of this recording, I think. And of course, in no instance is God's absence more glaring than in natural disasters, right? Except except maybe unnatural disasters. But somehow, believers all across the country are simultaneously able to sympathize with the doomed victims that suddenly found themselves engulfed in a firestorm and to believe that a loving deity is still running the show. And in a spectacular display of the sheer magnitude of their cognitive dissonance, the fact that one of the many buildings that didn't burn down was a church is being offered up as evidence of divine providence. Headlines like Newsweek's Maui Church Miraculously Unscathed, News Nation's Incredible Miracle, Maui Church Unscathed by Fire, and the New York Post's It's a Miracle, Catholic Church Untouched by Maui Wildfires, all attest to God's minimal but somehow still miraculous intervention. And I should emphasize here that there weren't like, you know, hundreds of refugees huddled in this church praying for deliverance as the fire bared down on them. The fucking thing was empty. Homes burned down all around it, some with families in them. And these headlines would have you believe that God just nodded along uh, through all of that until the fire started fucking with his property. And some fucking how they're selling it like he's the good guy in the story, if that were the case. Of course, this is always the case with religious people in the wake of a disaster, right? House catches fire, kills everybody inside, and then we get a feel-good story about the way that the Bible was miraculously unburned. A natural disaster kills a dozen people and Christians praise Jesus for all the nearby murders he didn't commit. Thousands of people die in a terrorist attack that collapses a skyscraper and we lionize God's grand effort at offering up a sympathetic lowercase t in the wreckage. I mean, imagine if we were all evaluated with as much leniency in our jobs as Christians give God. Right. It'd be like the only standard you guys would hold me to on this podcast was, well, that episode wasn't technically a hate crime. He nailed it. But somehow God, who by their reckoning has the highest possible potential for achievement, is graded by the lowest possible standard. 
Sure, he was asleep at the wheel when the wildfire came through. And sure, he invented wildfire and it was his idea to make humans flammable to begin with. But damn it, an elderly woman was able to find her old wedding band among the wreckage that used to be her home. So God is good. Five of five would pray to again. In fact, if you think about it, God's such an underachiever that they never even bothered to conceptualize true miracles. Right? Instead, they had these inherently selfish moments of random wish granting. Like, even if it wasn't just how coincidences work, it would still suggest a pretty shitty God. Because when he does miracle, it's pretty much always for just one person or one group of people limited in scope and geography. And by definition, it's never universal. It can't be. You know, God brings this person back to life, this one person in a hospital full of dying people. God solves one person's financial problems in a neighborhood full of poverty. God finds one person's lost keys without finding another person's lost child. Now, contrast this with science, right? I, I mean, it would be too much to say that we can all benefit equally from the advancements of science, but there aren't even any scientists researching for a cure to just Dave's cancer, Right, to the greatest possible extent, science's miracles are distributed to the world. Yes, we fall way short of that, right? But it is at least the ideal. In fact, one of the metrics that we use to judge a scientific breakthrough's usefulness is how universally applicable it is. How many people will be able to benefit from that? That's a basic question for science, but it's too much to ask a God. Even in their own telling, he's never actually eradicated a disease. Right. And for an omnipotent God, that would be damning enough, even if he wasn't the dude that invented those diseases in the first place. Of course, if we actually believed even the very worst of Christians, we'd have to accept that sometimes God does do repeat and widespread healing miracles by granting healing powers to the greasiest of his disciples. But again, because of the criminally low standard that religious people hold their God to, the people who believe that shit don't even bother to question why the person with the healing powers is in a mega church instead of a fucking emergency room. Their very concept of miracles is so self-centered that it doesn't even occur to them to ask. Now, to be clear, God simply isn't, right? That's the real answer. He doesn't do miracles, and the claims for his miracles are as limited as they are because religious people are stuck with shit that would have just happened by chance. But even if they were right, the best efforts of humankind would be more omnibenevolent than the best efforts of their omnibenevolent God, which is yet another reminder of how grievously they insult that God by believing he exists. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast and bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight is the Ken DeMai Allen, Eli Bosnick. Eli, <laughs> are you ready to beach? Sublime. All right. Well, quick, before Eli realizes <laughs> that that was an insult, we're going to pause for a word from this week's sponsor, My Sheets Rock. Hey. Hey, podcast listener. I'm Eli Bosnick. And I'm No Illusions, here to talk to you about a very serious problem. I'm talking, of course, about bed hog pets. That's right. You invited your pet into your bed because they were so darn cute and you couldn't wait for a night full of snuggles. But now they're fully grown and you spend all summer with a literal fur coat in bed with you. What's the solution? The regulator sheets from My Sheets Rock. My Sheets Rock created the regulator sheets, which are designed specifically to keep hot sleepers cool and cold sleepers comfortable. They regulate temperature, wick moisture, stay breathable, and they're so soft you'll sleep comfortably every night. And that's because these sheets are made from best-in-class bamboo rayon, the holy grail of sheeting. This miracle material transfers body heat two times more effectively than regular sheets and reduces humidity by 50% so you can experience your best night's sleep yet. It's true. My Sheets Rock sent us a set to try when they became a sponsor, and they quickly became our favorite sheets. Since then, we've bought two more sets. But Noah, what if I don't believe you? Don't believe me? Their five-star customer reviews speak for themselves. Plus, they offer a 90-day risk-free trial and free shipping and returns. Check out My Sheets Rock at MySheetsRock.com slash scathing and enter our code scathing for 10% off plus free shipping. That's MySheetsRock.com slash scathing, code scathing. My sheets rock. For the love of God, how can a pug take up this much space? You, you can have that one, My Sheets Rock. Yeah, that's for you. And now, back to the headlines. In our lead story tonight, Jesus is a liberal cuck and a snowflake. At least that's the assessment of modern evangelical Christianity, according to the assessment of editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, Russell Moore, uh, when he's trying to sell a book. But but regardless, Moore managed to grab national headlines when he told NPR interviewer Scott Detrow that Trump supporting parishioners all over the country are responding to Jesus's message by asking their pastors 
where they got their liberal talking points. <laughs> Becoming self-aware is a weird take for a right-wing book tour, but, you know, grind how you're going to grind, man. Yeah, right. right. Grind you how you're going to grind. to stand out, right. So for whatever it's worth, Russell Moore is one of the least bad of the prominent Christian leaders. He, he was the dean of theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And from that position, he condemned Donald Trump's rhetoric early and consistently, as well as his actions. He was one of the loudest voices in the Southern Baptist Convention speaking out against white nationalism. And he was also one of the most vocal critics of the SBC's shameful response to sexual assault and harassment complaints within the organization. He resigned from that organization in protest in 2021. Now, I, I want to be clear. He's still a professional liar who thinks that reproductive rights should be curtailed and LGBTQ people should be second class citizens. So he's not a good guy. But standing against the tarnish of modern American evangelicalism, even a well-polished turd shines pretty brightly. Yeah, I'd be a lot more sympathetic if this dude wasn't the fucking gateway drug and apologetic for the Christo-fascists he's pretending popped into existence in 2016. But yeah, good on you. Right. Good on you. <laughs> right. So after leaving the SBC, Moore wrote a book called Losing Our Religion, an altar call for evangelical America, all about how American Christians need to stop being so racist or they're going to lose the legal protection they have for homophobia and sexism. I, to be fair, I haven't, I haven't read the book. I'm just guessing. <laughs> That's my guess. Anyway, Part of the promotional tour included an interview on NPR's All Things Considered in which Moore shared what he said was a common story that he'd been told from multiple pastors, one in which they get done with a turn-the-other-cheek-based sermon and have to field questions about why they're teaching critical race theory. <laughs> Greg Locke is going to nail a new version where Jesus mows down the Pharisees with an AK-47 to some church doors and the cycle <laughs> will be complete. Right. They'll have a little tear tab if you want an indulgence. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but, but what really twists it in and breaks it off here, though, is that according to Moore, when the pastors are like, dude, I'm literally quoting Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The guy on your necklace, maybe you've heard of him. The parishioners are not like, oh, my bad. Instead, the response is, and this is quoting more again here, quote, yes, but that doesn't work anymore. That's weak. And then internal quote ends and, and more continues, quote, and when we get to the point where the teachings of Jesus are seen as subversive to us, then we're in a crisis, end quote. Hey, Russell, if you think that's bad, wait till you hear how often Christ said the world was going to end during his disciples' lifetime because <laughs> it's a lot, Russell. He said that a lot. Yes, definitely more than zero <laughs> times. So, so yeah, honestly, kudos to Moore for drawing more attention to this shit. As much as I want to point out that this was the inevitable result of American Christianity opening its arms wide as the last refuge for bigotry in the country. I also have to admit that the only real way out of this shit involves prominent Christians pushing back from the inside. Okay, so we're not even going to try the Phobe Mulcher 9000. Is what you're saying. We're just <laughs> it's not even just, it's try just it. logistically, it doesn't make sense, Eli. There's too many of them. But also, but if it's too late for that and we can't get them all into the Phobe Mulcher 9000, we need to at least remind the cultural Christians that the shit churches are doing now is so far from what they imagine when they think of Jesus that the folks in the pews today literally would not recognize Jesus if he showed up and started doing his greatest hits. <laughs> oh, it's true, though. And in chat, GPT's news. Podcast listener, no illusions is an ornery old goat. He doesn't like fancy restaurants. He's refused to let me buy several billboards throughout the course of our career. And he won't let me fire Heath. But when he slid into my DMs this week to let me tell you the following story, I knew he loved me like he'd been shopping at K Jewelers. Because this week, there's a new app called Text with Jesus. And you know what that means. What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. Christian freak out indeed. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. So the app in question comes from Catloaf Software, which long before ChatGPT already had a series of talk with X historical figure apps. However, in the past, those apps just provided sort of daily quotes or prompts about a certain topic. Now, with ChatGPT instructed to pretend to be Jesus, listeners can talk to a biblically accurate version of Jesus all they like and can chat with other biblical figures like Mary Magdalene and Satan for just oh, $2.99 a pop. Satan's in there. But now, don't don't get too excited. When I asked ChatGPT what my daughter's virginity was worth, he got very cagey about it. 
like I said, biblically accurate. <laughs> but not everyone is so pleased at the chance to chat with the big JC. When the app released online, users on Twitter chimed in with responses like, this is my favorite one, you are laughing now, but stealing the essence of our savior is no joke. What? Yeah. And still more <laughs> were offended that the chat bot wasn't more conservative. For example, several followers of ChristianHeadlines.com were displeased that while AI Jesus is against abortion, gay marriage, and trans rights, he's not harsh enough about it, with one user tweeting, these are damnable offenses. A citation of verse is not enough. Jesus. From the how can it really be Christian if there are no slurs in it department. That's getting to be a huge department, actually. Really is. Yeah, it's getting to be the department if you think about it. Okay. One last thing about this story. It's worth pointing out that you don't need an app to do this, right? You could just use, for instance, your company card to buy the website chatwithjesus.app. And then on that website, you could build a simple Jesus chat bot on Zapier to deploy on that website and then include some unpleasant surprises for conservatives so that, for instance, podcast listeners could send chatwithjesus.app to their conservative relatives <laughs> and share it online. You could do all of that, but... But don't, because I already did that. I already did that. Chat with Jesus.app, everybody. Yeah, Enjoy yeah. it. Have some fun. No, it's fun, but it still won't assign a monetary value to my daughter's virginity, though. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to pause for a quick break and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucid. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate race. It's a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Massachusetts. Sorry I've been away for so long, but I've been busy bathing in the salty and ever so slightly caffeinated tears of every douche bro in the manosphere who ever said, go woke, go broke. As Greta Gerwig's testament to woke feminism skyrockets its way up the all-time highest grossing movies list. It's in the top 25 as of this recording and the sixth highest that wasn't part of a series. But alas, as much as feminism dominates the box office, misogyny still runs the fucking world. So we'll turn our attention to that. And we'll start in Israel, where ultra-Orthodox lawmakers are trying to expand the power of all male religious courts and bar women from many public spaces that might also contain men. Even without legal authority, sexist zealots emboldened by Netanyahu's rhetoric are just taking power and forcibly barring women from public transportation and shit. And every indication is that this kind of thing is set to get worse. Now, to be clear, Israel's Supreme Court has ruled that it is illegal to force women to sit in separate sections on buses, trains, and airplanes. But as you know, if you've been listening long, this law is routinely ignored. On top of that, one of the biggest fights in Israeli politics is Netanyahu's effort to castrate their Supreme Court. And in order to rope in the support of these ultra-Orthodox factions, he's had to make a lot of sexist concessions. These include agreements to segregate audiences by gender at some public events and expanding the power of the aforementioned all-male rabbinical courts. And I should point out that the very political parties that are pushing for this shit don't allow women to run for office. So you can see how this shit falls in a self-reinforcing feedback loop pretty quick. I've also got a story out of India, thanks to astute listener Nick, who sent this one to scathingnews at gmail.com. Apparently, there's a staged video that's being shared around Indian social media meant to drum up prejudice against the country's Muslim minority and is specifically aimed at Muslim women. In the video, a Hindu guy supposedly thwarts a kidnapping by revealing that a woman in a burqa is actually a man in disguise. The video specifically warns viewers that there's been a rash of beburkid kidnappers and that they should be suspicious of anybody wearing one. And look, I'm no fan of the fucking burqa. There are all kinds of reasons you should kind of shudder when you see one. But putting this kind of bullshit message out into the tinderbox of religious tension in India right now is almost certainly going to have deadly consequences. And like in Israel, the sexist religious zealots are bolstered by a leader that has no qualms at all about exploiting that tension to drum up support for his base. But despite the international flavor of this segment, it's not like we need to go far from home to find sexism. So my final story comes out of the state of Texas. And like pretty much every story out of Texas, it's a sad one. It's about a prison guard named Celia Issa, who was seven months pregnant when she started having labor pains at work. She told her boss that she needed to go to the hospital, but he wouldn't let her leave. 
According to the lawsuit she filed against the state, he told her she was lying and just wanted to go home. Now, eventually, two and a half hours after she first alerted her boss, she was allowed to leave. She drove to the hospital as quickly as she could, where she was rushed into surgery, but it was too late. The fetus did not make it. So she sued, arguing that her boss's negligent action led directly to her miscarriage. And in defending their actions, or rather their inaction, the state of Texas is now arguing that her fetus didn't have a right to life to begin with. So yeah, arguably the most rapidly anti-abortion state in the union abandons that whole fetal personhood thing the instant it's going to inconvenience them. Just one worth keeping in mind whenever you meet a person who mistakes anti-abortion activists for people with principles. And on that important reminder, I'll wrap things up and hand you back over to Noah and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in home sweet homophobia news, there are a few things a family can choose to do that are more selfless, caring, and all around good than make the decision to adopt or foster a child. In spite of its reputation and those weird lives you always scroll past on TikTok, the foster system in this country is an incredible resource dedicated to keeping families whole and children safe. But two bigots in Massachusetts are out to change all that, damn it. And if they have to sue the state to do it, well, then that's what they're going to do. Yeah, because when has giving into religious zealotry ever caused problems in Massachusetts? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so here's the story. Michael and Catherine Kitty Burke, who look like the middle of a Shudder original movie about two people who are transformed into a couple's Facebook profile, applied to be foster slash adoptive parents this year. Oh, God, they look like the, the fucking plant couple at the timeshare pitch that's way too enthusiastic. Right, exactly. But it's with eating the flesh of children or something. <laughs> Yeah, so they filed the paperwork, they underwent a home inspection, and, as is standard operating procedure, underwent an interview about their beliefs towards LGBTQ plus children, since, you know, the state might accidentally give them one to raise. Sure. Yeah, no, I feel like a general list all the minorities you hate is a great screening question. I think they should all right? do that. You'd think. So in that interview, again, a process during which the couple was trying to look their best, they could not withhold their homophobia. Kitty, called gender-affirming care chemical castration, said that she would still love a gay child the same, but she would expect them to live a, quote, chaste life. And both of them out and out admitted that they would refuse to use a non-binary child's preferred pronouns. She, she actually said, I would love my gay kid as long as they weren't all gay about it. That was her official fucking answer. Wow. Yeah. <sighs> and her husband, Michael, did a lot better. He said that he would likely attend his gay child's wedding and that he wouldn't kick them out of the house or force them to go to conversion therapy. But there's a lot of wiggle room for some tremendously evil shit in those sentences. So obviously the couple were denied. And now they're suing the state for even asking those questions because being bigots to their future child is a constitutionally protected right. <sighs> it's their own faults for tricking me into saying the slurs to begin with. Yeah, this is truly, truly. You didn't have to be so Italian. And look, I want to be clear. This case has a strong chance of making it to higher courts and removing this kind of screening from adoption and fostering processes entirely. We read stories constantly on this show about couples being denied adoption or foster children because they're gay or they're just not Christian. But this case, this case promises to propel us into the full-on bizarro world where you're not even allowed to Ask people if they plan on abusing their foster kids homophobically. Right. Well, and and not that that's not enough, but it also won't just be homophobically either. Right. They will take this as far as they can in the blink of an eye and suddenly will be in. Well, the rod was sincerely held territory. <sighs> Tell me about it. Yeah. So, yeah. If anyone was feeling like now or, you know, ever was the time to rest on our laurels, the bell just rang for the first round in the homophobic child owners fight and things don't look great for our corner. Yeah. And finally tonight, in take a penny, leave a penny news, 
Fantastic. Tw- yeah, I, after that last story, I really felt like we needed to close on an upbeat here. One of these uh, <laughs> tiny sliver of good news. If you don't think about how long it took type stories that often we substitute for good news. And this week, that's going to come in the form of celebrating the fact that the Ohio State Medical Board finally got around to suspending the medical license of anti-vax darling Sherry Tenpenny. That's right. The only person keeping Dell Big Tree off the top of the silliest anti-vaxxer name chart was, until last <laughs> Wednesday, able to legally practice medicine. And did. Despite telling lawmakers in 2021 that COVID vaccines made people magnetic and forced them into involuntary interfaces with cell phone towers. Like physically, like they're physical bodies. Physically forced, yeah. The worst part is, you know, for someone, she was just like the nearest doctor to their house. And now now they got to get on ZocDoc and it's a whole <laughs> fucking thing. Well, no, she was running this weird integrative. Like you would have walked in there and go, oh, she's not the nearest doctor to me. She's a different <laughs> no, thing. No, no, I need a doctor. So yeah. I'm going to go. <laughs> So quick thanks to Kelly, who was the first to send us this story at scathingnews at gmail.com. Of course, longtime listeners have known about Sherry Tenpenny for a while. Now, she's been a prominent voice in the anti-vaccine movement for almost 20 years. She was featured in the documentary Vaxxed, which we reviewed on God Awful Movies, I think back in 2016. Ugh. But she was catapulted into the public eye in 2021 when a clip of her batshit testimony to the Ohio House Health Committee went viral. She was called as an expert witness by Republicans who almost immediately regretted it when she started babbling about how people who took the COVID vaccine became magnetized and then added actual quote. There's been people who have long suspected that there's been some sort of an interface yet to be defined interface between what's being injected in these shots and all of the 5G towers and quote. I mean, spoilers for the C segment this week, but I feel like I know where she got her material. I'm just yeah, going to say it now. You sure yeah. do. So, yeah. So this rant earned her no fewer than 350 complaints to the state medical board all along the lines of why the fuck do we let this person medicine? So the board tried to do an investigation, but apparently Ten Penny told them to go fuck themselves at pretty much every turn. According to the board's decision to indefinitely suspend her license, she, quote, flouted investigators who came to visit, declined to answer written questions, and objected wholesale to the regulator's inquiry, end quote. In fact, the board goes out of its way to say that the, the decision had nothing to do with vaccine-induced magnetism or malicious 5G towers, but rather is entirely predicated on her refusal to cooperate with their investigation. Yeah, she's like the medical version of those sovereign citizen body cams where the guys are like, I'm actually not driving. I'm operating my personal property. Oh, I'm arrested <laughs> anyway. God yes, damn it. right, right. God, I'd love the body cam footage of her not letting them investigate. And look, There's a real problem in American medicine where medical boards will consistently bend over backwards not to revoke a medical license, right? Like before Tenpenny ever testified that vaccines were turning people into unwitting fucking magnets, there were 15 solid years of great reasons to revoke her medical license. But it's nice to be reminded that there is at least some level of fuck around where these bastards eventually find out. And before that glimmer of hope fades below your jaded horizon, we're going to wrap up the headlines for the night. Eli, thanks as always. Jumanji! And when we come back, I'll offer Lucinda more exhibits for the future divorce hearings. <laughs> Lou, 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 doing Noah stuff. Noah stuff is my favorite stuff. Noah! Noah! Eli, what is this? What, what's with the beard? I'm from the future. Quickly, what's the date? What's today's date? It's the, it's the 17th. Thank goodness, I'm not too late. You have to tell your listeners to get tickets to our Halloween live show on October 28th in Las Vegas. Oh no, why? Well, when everyone finds out we're doing the QAnon-tastic movie Sound of Freedom, the tickets, they sell out too fast. The listeners become bitter and angry at their loss. They riot. A new political party is born. The fate of the world is at stake. Oh, no, but Eli, platinum tickets are already sold out and the VIP tickets only have a few left. Damn it, there's still time for Iridium. Tell them to go to godawfulmovieslive.com without delay. All right, I will. Godawfulmovieslive.com. I, I just, I still don't understand why you have such a long white beard, though. Oh, in the future, Grandpa Core becomes a thing? Trust me, it's, it's a thing. Ugh, got it. 
grandpa core. Good to know. Godawfulmovieslive.com After 16 chapters of David Icke's Everything You Need to Know But Have Never Been Told, I've learned my lesson about introducing chapters as though they had distinct topics. <laughs> Every chapter has a name and an ostensible subject, but quickly devolves into the same stream of consciousness bullshit as the last chapter and the one before that. So all I'm committing to in the intro is that we're going to start off with the words Chapter 17 Synthetic Human on this week's installment of Everything You Need. To nope. Now, obviously Heath isn't here this week, but luckily I know someone with a little experience breaking down terrible books for our audience. So, Lucinda, welcome back. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> Read 45 pages of conspiracy boomers ranting about nonsense is a weird welcome, but sure. Yeah, no, but it's not the worst way I've ever welcomed you to the show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's dive into chapter 17, shall we? Who am I? <laughs> sure, yeah. He starts off by explaining that synthetic is bullshit. Yeah, yeah. No, he says at this point, he's like, synthetic vitamins and supplements are biologically useless. And I'm like, oh, wow, did David Icke and I just agree? On and then he says, because they're synthetic. And I'm like, oh, never, never. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Close one. I was going to hit the we're agreeing with David Icke button that sends a message to Callie Wright. It's time for them to kill us with a samurai sword. But no, no, was, hey, we didn't have to. <laughs> See, yeah, right. We didn't have to. I don't to know do why it. we trust you with that button. <laughs> Well, he's like, they're synthetic tissues, synthetic drugs. How long before synthetic humans? And I'm like, because those are also nouns? Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, but but see, Lucinda, it's just like in those documentaries, Ghost in the Shell and Westworld. <laughs> Jesus. He even takes time to old man complain about how dark the cinematography is these days when he talks about Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> he does. Yeah, Stupid. yeah. I'm pretty sure he thinks the only version of Ghost in the Shell is the Scarlett Johansson movie. Oh, sure. <laughs> That's enough to just yeah. hate David Icke for that. <laughs> no, and this part's important uh, based on how much time he spends on it. We learn that synthetic humans will have no sexes and no reproductive organs. Yeah, he's like, why else would they make synthetic DNA? <laughs> Can't imagine any other use than living Ken dolls, I guess. <laughs> yeah. The idea that David Icke jumps entirely over birth defects and amputees and sickle cell to pussyless android slaves of Venus <laughs> tells you a lot about where his priorities are, doesn't right? it? Yeah, he goes, well, they've already made synthetic bacteria. Humans can't be far off. And I'm like, yeah, you know, what's one cell versus 30 trillion cells? It's pretty, they're pretty close. Rome wasn't built in a day, Noah. <laughs> But when the media reported on the synthetic bacteria, they never even asked about the obvious plan to replace the human race with sexless synthetic clones. That's how you know they're in on it. Right, right, because why yeah. wouldn't they ask? Right. And again, a reminder, this book was written in 2016-ish, so honestly, it wouldn't be much dumber than the stuff Fox News asked the Obama administration, so why not? You yeah, know? Well, they may have asked that in 2018. We don't <laughs> it's know. It's on brand. Right. Yeah. <laughs> But he tells us here that within 20 years, and again, this is of, of 2017 when the book came out, we're going to be able to pre-order our babies with specified genetic traits. And, and that'll be nice. Yeah. Some of us did this by meeting our wife's parents. Thank you very much. But, you know, <laughs> you know I guess eh. long way around. Well, he's like, people have been scaremongering about this for 90 years, which really shows you how much the lizard Jews are slow playing it. You yeah. know, they're taking their time. Right, right. <laughs> no, And then he, he quotes... Brave New World in 1984 back to back because apparently he's limited to the books I read in high school. <laughs> well, also, 23andMe and Ancestry.com are a satanic Jew lizard plot to steal your genetic information. Obviously. Obviously, yeah. Clearly. Yeah. So first we collect the Mormons DNA, then sexless Ken dolls, then profit. Profit. Yeah, no, obviously, <laughs> obviously. He goes, I have exposed the horrors of the Mormon mafia in other books. And I'm like, which other books, David? I need this information. <laughs> Noah, if you make us read another David Icke book, Heath and I are forming a union. I'm just letting you know right now. <laughs> well, and lest we think for a second that we've already reached rock bottom in the 608 pages of anti-Semitism we've read so far, the next subchapter is titled Transgender Agenda. Uh. 
Yeah, see, the real reason we see so much more about trans people now is that they're trying to prep us for sexless synthetic people. Well, obviously, the Ken dolls, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, but even if that were true, right? If I had to choose between sexless people and men like David Icke, I feel like I would still go with the sexless Ken yeah, dolls no, anytime, right? <laughs> Obviously. Well, see, it's our own damn fault for not asking more questions about that T that was hiding between the B and the Q the whole time, <laughs> damn it. I'm sorry, that's on me. I thought it was time to be queer. I thought it was a flourish. <laughs> I should have asked. <laughs> well, then out of nowhere, he goes, who else has a penis and lady boobs? Baphomet. Right. Exactly. Wait, what? The <laughs> fuck? David, you got to stop clicking the first result on Google Images, Dave. That's on you. That's on you, buddy. At a certain <laughs> point, yeah, a certain number of times. But he insists he doesn't care how other people identify, of course, quote, as long as they don't try to force it on anyone yeah. else, end quote. By which he means, of course, use the bathroom. Right, yeah. Oh, look, it's David Icke and Richard Dawkins' latest blog post agreeing. Mm -hmm. Callie, I'm hitting the button. Callie, <laughs> Callie, I'm hitting the button. I'm hitting it. I'm hitting it a couple of times over here. Oh, God. And he really thought he had something here with that. Like, he starts talking about non-binary, more like only binary because of the synthetic robot brains that are, you know, coded, coded in binary. <laughs> It's like me trying to do puns at the end of a citation needed essay. Because <laughs> computers are in... <laughs> <laughs> the terms boy, girl, mom, and dad have been banned, apparently, by the transgenders, too, by the way. Yeah. Oh, obviously. Yeah. No. He goes, why? There's a school in the UK that's thinking of letting boys wear skirts. And I'm like, oh, can you imagine on the island of Great Britain, men in skirts? What, what's next? <laughs> Jesus. He also warns that doctors are prescribing sex change hormones to 12-year-olds. Yep. Hey, there it is. I will say, people are often like, oh, what's it been like reading David Icke? And my answer genuinely is it's like getting a sneak peek into the next 10 years of Republican politics. That's <laughs> Honestly, what it's like. Yes. Yeah. No, he's, he's a legitimate thought leader in the GOP at this point. But yeah, and speaking of which, the real problem here, of course, is that the lizard Jews are afraid of manliness. Yeah, I mean, have you seen Conan the Barbarian? Dude knows how to handle a lizard. No, okay? that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, he goes full Tucker Carlson at this point and starts freaking out about falling sperm counts. Jesus. We've been freaking out about this since 1992, and yet nothing has happened. What's your takeaway, dude? Yeah. <laughs> really? Right. No, he's like, anti-man political correctness is causing male birth rates to plummet. And I'm like, all right, well, that's a new one, though. That is a new one. Right. Well, what he adds, quote, and the white male in particular. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. I'm confused about what he's picturing here. People are coming home from a long day of not being able to sexually harass people. And then they're like, I don't know that I can shoot a Y chromosome into you tonight, honey. My, my heart just isn't <laughs> in it. I feel like not a Caucasian I'm, one. I'm yes. blasting all X's today. I can just feel it. <laughs> well, and then we see that he comes out and he actually says that the pesticides are making the frogs gay. It took Ooh. 611 pages to get there, but I knew we would find it in here somewhere. And for me, it's like a Bob Dylan song. Like, I liked the Alec Jones cover better. Right. You know? Yeah, no, that's fair. <laughs> but the key here is that the world is in danger of losing its mansplaining. Right. No, that's who's going to rescue the damsels when they're in distress? And then he starts literally calling for violence against the shape-shifting Zionist lizard aliens. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And this subsection is such an adventure for me because he's saying all the bad things that are going to stop. And I was like genuinely half a page into this section before I realized he meant he wanted them to stay. <laughs> right, yeah, right, right. But he says that they're turning us into a, a bunch of snowflakes by stealing our testosterone. Oh, sorry, he says that that's the chapter's thesis to this point. <laughs> yeah, David, be careful. People might start writing, I don't know, 600 page books about how their YouTube got shut down. <laughs> <laughs> it can't be sexist if he's also worried about women getting less manly. No, that's true. That's, that's true. That's how feminism works. And then he's like, and now let me explain how epigenetics work. And I'm like, oh, bet this goes swimmingly. <laughs> he goes, epigenetics is like how the Chinese censored the internet. <laughs> yep. What? Yep. Got it in one. So what do you guys want to talk about now? How's Georgia today? Is it warm? <laughs> the fuck you guys make me Warm in Georgia? It's a rainy. Um, <laughs> 
But basically what we learn is that they're passing down snowflakery epigenetically. This whole transgenderism is robbing us of our testosterone argument is going to seem really silly when somebody tells him about trans dudes, right? Right. Um, who do you think we're giving all the robbed testosterone to, Lucinda? <laughs> it's a Robin Hood situation. Think, think, damn you. <laughs> well, and then he's, once again, he cites more gelin fibers as evidence that he's right about the nanotech. Yeah, yeah, they're sneaking nanoconductors into your skin and organic shells. Sure the fuck mm -hmm. are. He goes, and they come in hexagons and pyramids. You know what else has hexagons and pyramids? Environmental fallout. I'm like, where are we even? Right? <laughs> right, wait, well, he also warns that Monsanto is going to patent fucking and we'll have to license it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And hey, look, in the Jew lizard's defense who run Monsanto, I think a stopgap on fucking for a pretty huge percentage of the human population sounds like an okay idea. Like, no, let's, really. let's hear him out on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then he reveals step one of their evil plan. Kids these days with their smartphones and their iPads. Oh, my fucking oh. God. I know it's a podcast and so we shouldn't talk about the visuals in this book too often, <laughs> but the visual aids for this subsection are like exclusively provided by the boomer means that radicalized your grandma, like exclusively. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Oh, there's this great moment where he's like, oh, and be very leery of any of Apple's AR products. And I'm like, man, the price tag is doing that for you. David. You don't have to. <laughs> but, but then he, he throws out a bunch of like, you know, people sure do use their phones a lot statistics. Right. Mm -hmm. right. It, it's weird when he gets one right. You almost want to just give him a biscuit. <laughs> That's right, David. <laughs> Using your phone late at night will inhibit proper sleep. Right. Well, but he talks about this as this unique danger. And I'm like, ah, as opposed to my day when all the teenagers got plenty of sleep every night. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so and we learned that step two of their evil plans is phones that you can wear. He's like, like, for example, smartwatches, Bluetooth devices, Google Glass. I'm like, oh, you couldn't think of a third one, could you? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, your Apple Watch is spying on your pulse. Watch out. <laughs> yeah. Does it count as spying when it asks you six dozen times during the same scary movie if you're having a heart attack? It's weird <laughs> spying if it does. <laughs> Well, and then we learn that step three will be implantable phones. Yes. Yeah. And I got to talk about another one of the images because figure 600 shows this tiny little microchip on the end of a person's fingertip. And the caption, it just says, all it says is gotcha in all caps in italics with seven A's and an exclamation mark. Okay. Yeah. Genuine question. Taking a little survey here. Do we think that David found a photo of a microchip and thinks he caught one? <laughs> or are just microchips a gotcha in general? What are hmm. we thinking here? Right. I don't think he knows. So he, he, he goes like, people will get shipped to get through airport security quicker. And I'm like, dude, I would volunteer to be turned into a gay frog if it got me through airport security <laughs> right? quicker. I mean, Lucinda, back me up. If he keeps mouthing off to Irish Border Patrol, it might happen. Okay, you right. don't know what powers she had. That's true. I mean, he really just has to look at him horrifyingly. <laughs> Yeah, he's terrified of Alexa and Siri, too, obviously. Sure. We're talking about David Icke now, not, <laughs> not, not, not Also, he says that AI chatbots are already growing out of control. He was doing that in 2017, so that was before it was cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I assume the reason he hasn't written a book lately is that he's just on the home screen of ChatGPT screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Eli, he has a whole, but I'm not a Luddite paragraph bolded at the end of this subchapter. Come bolded, on. no less, yeah. Bolded. <laughs> Yeah, he's like, you know, I'm not scared of technology, just technological addiction and dependency. Also, microwaves, those scare the microwave ovens and just microwaves in general, those scare the hell out of me, too. Yeah, Jesus. exactly. Then we learn that the real reason for Starlink is so that we can't escape Elon's prying eye no matter where we go. You're right. It's that and so that Noah doesn't have to time our gam records by the phases of the moon. Those well, are the well, two yeah. purposes of Starlink. <laughs> Yeah, if so, I'm like, yeah, man, if we're not careful, soon we'll be surrounded by satellites. <laughs> it goes, why would Musk invest so much in Starlink if it's a terrible business model? <laughs> and 2023 is like, do I have news for you, David? Yeah, right. Check this right. out. Right. And then he got way too proud of himself for the, for the title of the subchapter on Peter Thiel. That would be Teal of Fortune. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Credit where credit is due. That's pretty good. No, it's bad. No, that's right, not yeah. bad. That's not bad. But he's like, Peter Thiel contributed over a million dollars to Trump's campaign. And I'm like, all right, you don't have to keep going. He's an evil fucking alien. Listen, I'm on board. <laughs> right. right, exactly. We should cut off his face just in case. Yeah, I just think we're all on board here. Yeah, he's like, the Palantir Technologies is evil. And I mean, it's a company, so probably. Yeah, that's turn. pretty easy to, to call. Okay. Also, he has this weird bit where he tells us that Gotham is an Illuminati code word for goat home. Huh? Or Saturn, because that's where Satan lives and he's a goat. All right. Okay, so when the Illuminati were doling out their cool fucking signs and signals, dollar bills got the pyramid with the eye and fucking Gotham got... Kind of sounds like goat. I mean, that's last pick, right? <laughs> anything that's last yeah. pick. Yeah, he, he's like, they're trying to create a universe simulation, but then remembers that his whole thing is that we're already in a simulation, I guess. So mm-hmm. he panic adds a simulation in a simulation. He does. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So also, in the figure 602 is the picture of Trump and the Saudi royalty and the Egyptian president all touching that weird glowy ball. And to be honest, that photo, from the second I saw it, I was like, that was custom made for the margins of a David Icke book. Yeah, that one was for Dave. That one's for them. Honestly, I just don't think Trump is competent enough to run an evil orb. Otherwise, I'd be on board, Dave. I really would. <laughs> They're going to track everything everyone thinks so that they can control everything everyone thinks. Seems yep. redundant to me, but... Really, honestly. Yeah. It just be me. Also, radiation is coming to get you. Mm-hmm. Right, because the Jew aliens need an atmosphere constructed within the frequency band of radiation or luminous fire. What? Yeah. I was like, oh my God, he's about to tell us that their breath gas reacts to radiation. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen this movie. Uh, to be clear, though, like heat is radiation. So mm-hmm. is like purple. Re- really? I- <laughs> yeah. But what he's getting at here, though, of course, is that the worst kind of radiation of all is 5G. <gasps> Yeah, from figure 604 in the book, he's got a picture of a 5G tower dressed up like a fucking cactus. And he's like, they're trying to hide it. Right, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, those ads I get for 5G every 11 seconds on every possible website are the perfect disguise. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, God. he's he, and, and of course, he started talking about frequencies. And frequency is one of those words that doesn't need to mean anything at all to conspiracy theorists, right? It's like energy. It's just a word. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, harp is manipulating your emotions by bouncing frequencies off the ionosphere. Yes. Yeah. For example, right. Seems like such a waste. A, a mediocre Christmas commercial writer can manipulate my emotions. You don't need harp for this. <laughs> right. He goes, it's well documented how the U.S. used brain and training devices to make enemy troops surrender. As in... There are, you know, documents. Did you write them, David? <laughs> no comment on who wrote them. There are documents. Yeah. He quotes from a guy who claims to have discovered that the government is using synthetic telepathy through 5G towers. Yes. And I, for one, am super excited for his congressional hearing. Yeah, no, it should be fun. <laughs> then in a valiant effort to, I guess, knock every remaining conspiracy out in the course of one book, he explains how microwaves from 5G smart meters increase mercury vapor releases from tooth filling. Jeez. Oh my God. It feels like he's cramming all the bullshit in here at the end, like a fucking Victorian love letter writer running out of ink. Just, and in <laughs> conclusion, you are the son of the sky. Right, right. He's like, also somewhat related, Fukushima planned event. Mm-hmm. It's true. Did you notice no Jews came to work at the Fukushima power plant? That <laughs> no, day. that's probably correct. Well, and then he's like, let me explain the dangers of Wi-Fi. And I'm like, let me butter my popcorn. Yep. Yeah. Be right. good. Pretty much the next fucking line is Wi-Fi is microwaving your brain as we speak. <laughs> God, the man speaks in clickbait. Here's what the cell phone companies don't want you to know. Yep. Click here. Uh, but yeah, so, so to be clear, cell phones give you brain cancer. That's why there's been that skyrocketing incidence of what's that? Never never mind. There's not. <laughs> oh. He warns us that the government attacks dissident groups with cancer lasers. <laughs> yeah. Pew! And now we wait 30 or 40 years. Yeah, no, eventually, <laughs> though, we're getting our revenge on you. Mammogram? Oh, God. At one point, he says, like, people receive a cell phone call every 11 minutes. That's the stat he tries to, like, I'm like, Jesus, I see why Heath needed to take this episode off. That would be very traumatizing for him to read that <laughs> statistic. 
Yeah, I mean, to be fair, David Icke seems like the kind of guy that answers and looks into each of those spam calls about how his business has been approved for money from yeah, the government. Right. So, yeah, you know. Oh, God, he goes, pull together the strands of all the elements that I've described for you, and this is what you get. And I'm like, oh, do tell, David. <laughs> A technological subreality within the satellite bubble of the Wi Fi information cloud controlled by AI beamed at the entire Earth. <laughs> That's an actual Ex fucking Cedra. It continues like that. That's what like, the fuck did you guys make me read? This is like a third <laughs> of that sentence. It's <laughs> yes. incredible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It, it's like he's playing the I want in a picnic car game, but with his own psychosis. Yeah, and he's right. The only and one I playing. brought a can and a box. <laughs> Well, then he talks about a harp whistleblower and we're reminded that bullshit is among the substances one can blow through a whistle. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> well, yeah, no, he's starting to drown in his own nonsense, right? He's like, harp is changing your DNA with the radiation frequencies of the weaponized plasma for the weather control hologram. Someone stop okay. me. <laughs> Kevin Spacey, we just need you to switch limps and get out of here, buddy. All right, stop reading the furniture. Well, he keeps talking about the dangers of ionizing radiation. And I'm like, hey, is that the kind from cell phones? No. Oh, yeah. Suddenly changes it. Also, also, this is where he says that the windmills are giving you cancer. Of course they are. The sound of the wind. He actually says that directly or otherwise, Donald Trump and David Icke are getting their information from the same fucking source. And I think mm -hmm. that source is David Icke's asshole. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty sure. Yeah, but, but the goal is to make like Saturn type rings of chemtrails all around the Earth. And the rings would be a giant space CD they could store the hologram on. Exactly. Sure. <laughs> right. And see, now this whole book, I've been wondering why Saturn based lizard Jew aliens would create a hologram within a hologram. But now I know it's for more hard drive space. And as a MacBook Pro user, can I say, I get it. Yeah, I do understand. No, it's fair. really hard to upgrade. <laughs> But they're infesting our bodies through chemtrails, vaccines, food, and drink. And I kind of feel like if they've got food and drink, they really don't need the other two. <laughs> right? Yeah, because that's easier. Oh, God. And then he tries to describe scalar fields, and that goes as exactly as well as you'd expect it to go. Honestly, the fact that he didn't land on Jew Lizard Nudist Beach impressed me. Because <laughs> right? it's right there in the name. <laughs> Yeah, but he seems to think that the scalar field is A, a place, and mm -hmm. B, in another dimension. Yes, it's a place in another dimension. Then he goes, we're being invaded from within. And I'm like, no, dude, that's just being, right? There's no vaded. <laughs> <laughs> but he tells us that they could heal everyone's cancer with their scalar field, but they choose to be evil with it instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe the lizard nudist beach would have made more sense. I don't, <laughs> Now I'm starting to think. Honestly, yeah. They're going to kill off all the old useless people. I see why they hit so close to home, dude, but no, we aren't. Yeah, it's funny how the groups that are always most worried about death panels tend to be the groups that should be most worried about death panels. <laughs> right? <laughs> Eventually, he just goes, everything is killing us except climate change, which is still bullshit. Right. Yes. Yeah. GMO specifically, they're going to kill us. Yeah. So why do the Illuminati need so many ways to kill us, by the way? Just, you know, pick a plan and stick with it, people. Right? It's just ridiculous. Okay, maybe there's like one ADHD former gifted child Jew lizard at the core of this. That would make a lot <laughs> of this make sense. Yeah, but, but GMOs give you diseases because their frequencies don't line up with your body's frequencies because of the synthetics. And of course, they're also killing us with vaccines. And by they, he means Bill Gates and Bono. <laughs> right, yep, mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah. He's like, this effort to force vaccines on people has gone too far. And I'm like, really? 2017? Has it gone too far? <laughs> he's like, they treat anti-vaxxers like the enemy. And I'm like, yeah, that's because they are the enemy. They're the enemy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then he remembers that this chapter was supposed to be about synthetic humans. So he starts complaining about how AI is taking our jobs. OK, broken clock twice a day. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or as ChatGPT would put it, as an AI model, I cannot tell time. Moreover, there are many cultural factors to consider when it comes to time, and it's very important to consider. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> but seriously, how much easier would it be to address this very real problem if it hadn't been fodder for the David Ikes of the world for the last 30 years or so? Right, right. I will say, though, nothing comforts me more in terms of the AI apocalypse than being reminded how confident we were that we'd all have driverless cars the day after tomorrow in 2017. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, to be fair, with the amount that I text and drive, all my cars are technically driving. Oh, well, that's, I'm, just, yeah, I'm that's just sitting bad. there. Stop doing that. <laughs> He's like, soon AI will replace judges, and then the AI could have the racial bias that we already know that human judges <laughs> have. I was going to say, David, let, let me know when the AI judges start selling black kids to juvenile detention <laughs> centers, huh? Yeah. Yeah, he has a point, but there could be bias in the application of criminal justice if we aren't careful isn't the way to get there. Right. Yeah, no, there are plenty of good arguments against AI taking over jobs. This is not one of them. No. He also he says at this point that they're going to make robots with human emotions, and I'm like, as revenge against the robots? <laughs> Yeah, it's part of their new series, Terminator 7, Judgment Day. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Judgy. All right, so also, David, Heath can handle you coming after vaccines and Jewish people, but leave his realistic sex robots out of it, damn it. There's it's no true, need. yeah, he comes for the sex robots. <laughs> yeah. Also, and I hope you're sitting down for this one, AI is going to have laser weapons. Yes, right. Murderous AI. He says the first instance of a machine killing a person for law enforcement was 2016. And I'm like, I feel like they had guns before that. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I'm not saying those robot dogs from Boston Dynamics aren't scary. I'm saying that if anyone from that company can loan us one to chase David around his local town for a little bit, <laughs> we are willing to pay you in cash, Boston Dynamics. I will throw in. He goes, Russia has a gunslinging robot that can fire guns with both hands. And I'm like, I honestly don't even doubt that, really. <laughs> yeah, every sane book on world events ends with a hysterical warning about robot armies coming for your freedom. So he's nailing this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when I worry about war, it's definitely about clumsy land units. Like, that's the big thing that I <laughs> right. worry about. Yeah. <laughs> She's, he starts scaremongering about this AI cop in Dubai before eventually sheepishly admitting that it's just a mobile info desk that you can report oh, crimes God. to. Yeah, wait till he hears about the IHOP robot. They're coming for your pancakes, David. <laughs> your pancakes, I say. Yeah, so, and he's like, and just as a heuristic, though, you can always tell something's evil if a bunch of Zionists are involved. I'm like, David, come on, man. It was supposed to be thinly veiled, wasn't it? <laughs> I was promised a veil. Well, then out of nowhere... In a specific fuck you to Eli, he's like, also, psychiatric medicine is evil. Yes. Yeah. To be fair, also contains a bunch of rich Jews. So, like, oh, you know, that's I get fair. It, Yeah, right. I'm a lot saying. of Zionists I, I do get in it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and apparently Nat Geo did a series on transhumanism right before this went to print. So, David Icke had to, and another thing, the shit out of this chapter, by the way. He really oh, did, yeah. Didn't he? Yeah, no, the key message here is... Don't upload your consciousness to a global collective without asking the tough questions first. Yeah, like, will I have to share a consciousness with David Icke? Because I would prefer the void, sure. personally. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, but if anybody can stand up to transhumanism, that, that is the concept of making humans into more, it's you, Davey. Uh-huh, yeah. Sure. The end of this chapter reads like he thinks it's the end of the book, which... Uh, Suggests to me that even David Icke is shocked by his verbosity. Right? Yeah. Yeah, but no, there's still more because there's always still more, uh -huh. which we're going to talk about on the next installment of Everything You Need to Know. Before we fade to black tonight, I want to remind you one more time that there's a link to get tickets to our Vegas live show in the show notes, and you'll want to take advantage of that quickly before those tickets sell out. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight. We'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I need to thank Heath, whose influence echoes into the show even when he's gone. I need to thank Eli Bosnick, whose illegal incitements to violence echo in my ears even as I delete them from the show. I want to thank Lucinda Delusions for going above and on this week to help us out when Heath was gone. Also want to thank Morgan for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. Look for a link to his YouTube channel on the show notes. But most of all, of course, I need to thank over a month's worth of awesome people at this point. Deep breath, deep breath. Here we go.
Andrew, Liam, AJ, Nathan is back, baby, Anikis, Jan X, Mans, Julie, Larry, Tanner, Jake, Nanners, Tyler, Guthrie, Cutpurse, Gothic, Peter and Kathy, Paul, Crazy Grateful, Matthew, Callan, Michael, GT, Buzzsaw, Kristen, Kevin, Kalevi, Bob, Chris, Margaret, Aaron, Pavanisa, Ryan, Matt, Santa Grimnard, Gene and Mad Hatter, 78 and counting, Pega, Jace, Carrie, Tylan, Eli, I Fuck My Dad, Sunday, Adam, First Atheist, President, Fried Goo, Ryan, Terry, Clay, Ravenclaw, Danielle, Jack M, This Fish Flies, Titus, BF, David, Travis, Trembleus, Jamie, You Got the Touch, You Got the Power, Mark, JJ, Rachel, Honda, Quality Control, Skeptic, Carl, Corey, Christopher, Joseph, Andreas, Richard, fucking Macy, Nathan, Ed, Sarah, Thomas, Brandon, FC, Cody, and Katie. <sighs> Whose colossal little X are the only thing that can stand astride all the various jurisdictions Trump has been indicted in now. Together, these 75 people, phrases, food products, and outdated indictment counts join forces to help our relentless fight against made-up bullshit this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the money it takes to have less of it right now, but if you do, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathingatheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad-free version of every episode, or you can make a one-time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but not with money, you can also help a ton by leaving a five-star review, telling a friend about the show, and following us on social media. And speaking of social media, Tim Robertson handles that for us, and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark, who will also wrote all the music that was used in this episode, which was used with permission. If you have questions, comments, or death threats, you can find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com. One more. Just one? I think there's two. Ah, uh, he's just here for that Shit. one, right? Yeah, who is it? Is like, not for me, there is. <laughs> not for me, yeah, she's on the last <laughs> one. the fuck out of here! I quit! <laughs> <laughs> The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. My brother-in-law died suddenly, and now my sister and her kids have to sell their home. That's why I told my husband we could not put off getting life insurance any longer. An agent offered us a 10-year, $500,000 policy for nearly $50 a month. Then we called SelectQuote. SelectQuote found us identical coverage for only $19 a month, a savings of $369 a year. Whether you need a $500,000 policy or a $5 million policy, Select Quote could save you more than 50% on term life insurance. For your free quote, go to SelectQuote.com. SelectQuote.com. That's SelectQuote.com. Select Quote. We shop, you save. Full details on example policies at SelectQuote.com slash commercials. You know the best place to go for lunch? Penn Station East Coast Subs. Penn Station has hot grilled subs. Those fresh cut fries are awesome. Yeah, you'll probably eat too many, but they are so good. Oh, and fresh squeezed lemonade. The chicken teriyaki, incredible. But people also love the Philly cheesesteak. I mean, how could you not, right? It tastes great, and they make it right in front of you. Yeah, whether it's online ordering, in-store, or sports season catering, you gotta love Penn Station. There's one near you. Go now. Penn Station East Coast Subs.